Don't be ashamed to learn things that you need to know. Here's Sex Explanations with Dr. Doe. Sex Explanations podcast, episode 18. I'm Lindsay, your host for today. Your host always. I have my doctorate in human sexuality. I have a private practice in Missoula, Montana. I do this show called Sex Explanations, both the podcast and the YouTube channel. And part of that means that I get to hang out with cool people and talk about sex or whatever comes up during those conversations. Today's special co-host is Ash. Hello. Hi. Woo. <laughs> Ash, I don't know a ton about you, but I'm going to see if I can come up with a few things. One, you're very cool. You're wearing a Sexplanations t-shirt. True. Which, uh, that just I mean, like, puts you there. in the cool category. <laughs> um, I put out an email to all of the people working for Complexly, which is the company that helps produce the Sexplanations podcast and the Sexplanations YouTube channel, saying, do any of you want to be on this show? And you were the first person to say, pick me, pick me, <laughs> which is just incredible. And then we have lots of mutual friends mm -hmm. that all speak highly of you. So that's what I have. Oh, um, awesome. Can you tell me what you bring to the table? Tell our audience why you're such a good match for this topic in particular, and this topic being how we categorize sexual orientation. Totally. So, yeah, as kind of a background of me, I work to help put on VidCon, so that's why I'm a part of the Complexly family. Yeah. Um, but I also make content on YouTube, so I've been watching Sexplanations for a while, so it was just like already exciting to be like, oh my gosh, like I love this channel and there's a podcast and I'm actually being invited to talk on it, so yay! I have a lot of experience with sexual orientation and fluctuating and trying to figure it out and, you know, from dating men to dating women to dating non-binary people to just kind of having to figure out what the heck that means for me, as mm -hmm. well as what kind of labels or categories I fit into through all of those fluctuations. So I think that this is a pretty cool topic for me because it's kind of my experience has just been all over the place that I feel like this is something that I can actually talk about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so. you you can be the expert here. <laughs> And tell us all, you know, what you think and what you've experienced and how we can hopefully do it better. First, let's play a clip of the Sex Scales Explanations episode that this is based on, and then we'll we'll go into a deeper conversation. It's Dr. Doe's mission to now explain these sex positions. A man named Dr. Alfred Kinsey did one of the largest studies of human sexual behavior in the 1940s. The findings of his study, published in these two volumes, gave the world a much deeper understanding of sexuality. <coughs> As Dr. Alfred Kinsey puts it, there are not two discrete populations, heterosexual and homosexual. The world is not to be divided into sheep and goats. This is true of sexual orientation, how we're oriented with others sexually, if at all. Kinsey created a seven-point Likert scale to show how we describe sexual orientation. A Kinsey zero is someone who is exclusively heterosexual. A Kinsey six, someone who is exclusively homosexual. The way that I remember this is when one of my classmates very homosexual, raised his hand and said, I'm a Kinsey 10. Six reminds me, top of the numbers, higher numbers, more homosexual in behaviors. And the lower numbers indicate more heterosexual or interest in opposite sex partners. Kinsey 1 is predominantly heterosexual with an incident of homosexuality, and a Kinsey 5 is predominantly homosexual with an incident of heterosexuality. 2 and 4 are more than incidences, so heterosexual with more than an incidence of homosexuality, and homosexual with more than an incident of heterosexuality. And a Kinsey 3 is equal parts heterosexual and homosexual. If a person identifies as asexual, sexual orientation is denoted by an X. This is an effort at depicting orientation. It doesn't mean it's a done deal. I mean, Kinsey's scale doesn't even account for non-binary genders or pansexuality. Other models do account for all these variables like gender, and fantasies, and time. Fritz Klein even came up with a method that brings in emotional and social preferences and lifestyle and how you would identify regardless of the algorithm. Dynamic, multivariable, differences over time, and then many variables to consider, sexual attraction, sexual behavior, sexual fantasies, the emotional preferences, social preferences, and lifestyle preferences you have, and even your political identity. There are hundreds of different ways to describe sexual orientation. Yours might be the next leader in how we classify each other. That's if we need to be classified at all. Okay, 
clip's over. I also want to do a shout out to our patrons on patreon.com slash sexplanations podcast. You can go there, support the episodes that we make here, the podcast. There's also Sexplanations Patreon page for the YouTube channel. Any support you can give helps create more accessibility to comprehensive sex education. So for the individuals, though, that really go out there on our behalf they get a special announcement of their names as well as a question in their honor. So Laura Schuster, Donna Flint, Maddie O'Sullivan, Paul Nixon, and the Millers, this one is for you. Testies, testies, explanations, testies. Which of the following is not a way to describe sexual attraction to women? <laughs> I was working so hard on coming up with a question <laughs> that wouldn't be wrong and wouldn't be aggravating. So we'll we'll see what oh, we've got here. And then I started typing the answers and just thought, oh, I'm such a clever person. Uh, so hopefully this works out well. <laughs> Again, which of the following is not a way to describe sexual attraction to women? A, homosexuality. B, heterosexuality. C, bisexuality. Or D, asexuality. Can you rephrase the, like, actual question <laughs> one more time? <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. Which of the following is not a way to describe sexual attraction to women? Okay. Homosexuality, heterosexuality, bisexuality, or asexuality? Asexuality. Yeah. I was like, at first I was like, oh, easy. And then I was like, wait a minute. There are other people involved opposed, like, not just me. I was like, oh, heterosexuality. And then I was like, no, wait. <laughs> right. <laughs> women are still involved. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Because so much, I think, of how we identify sexual orientation has to do with how we identify our gender or mm -hmm. sex or sex assigned at birth, bisex, however we want to, to make those labels. Which I think is exactly what you're getting to when you say, I've experienced sexual attraction to all of these different people. And so does that change your sexual orientation? Hmm. <laughs> I mean, I think that this is something that I've kind of grappled with most mm -hmm. of my life. Like, you know, what the heck is my sexual orientation if it's so confusing and in flux and like it is so with all the the different ways that gender can be expressed and all of that. Mm -hmm. I think that I just eventually got to the point where, like, I identify as queer because, uh, like, I just don't – I can't be bothered anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm not straight, so I – anything else can kind of be in flux under that category of, like, I'm queer, some variation at any given point of that. So how would you describe your sexual attraction? Like, how do you know – when you want to have sex with someone or cuddle well, with them or look at them longingly in the eyes. <laughs> I think for me, like, you know, out of all of the, like, more general labels of sexuality, I would kind of identify most with pansexuality. Okay. So it's more of a, like, you know, emotional attraction to someone for me, and it doesn't really matter what else comes along with it. So for me, like, I'm only interested sexually if, like, that person is appealing to me, whether it be, you know, like, I'm physically attracted to this woman or I have an emotional connection with this man or, you know, my partner's non-binary and it was more of a we walked up to each other and then it was instant chemistry ah. that I couldn't explain. So for me, it's not really, like, I don't know. It's just kind of for me to be interested sexually is, like, well, what else is going on? And then I'm like, oh, let's see where else this can go. Is that kind of yes. your question? Yes, <laughs> yes. I think that's the way it is for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. uh, so regardless of the other person's anatomy, chromosomal makeup, hormones, mm -hmm. et cetera, there is, like you described, a chemistry or some sort of unsolved mystery about why <laughs> this person is appealing to you, and then you choose whether or not to investigate that. Mm -hmm. And then maybe end up pressing your genitals together. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, yeah, genitals. Okay, so I don't know if you know this, but there's also controversy around this term because genital comes from the root of genesis and this beginning and life and creation, oh, et cetera. And so it's kind of marking the reproductive anatomy, also controversial, as reproductive and not saying, like, this could have non-reproductive function. Oh, totally. I would have never thought about that. I think for me, like, the term genitals is just so 
almost like sterile and like based in science from my understanding of it, the category mm -hmm. that I place it in, mm -hmm. that I would have never even thought of the context that it actually <laughs> right? came Well, with. and that's how a lot of people view the terms male and female, that it has this medical scientific origin. And so why are we messing around with it? Or they're saying we should be messing around with it because it's a, a medical designation for something that we like these human ideas about a binary world. And anyway, that's all to say that my profession, the field of sexology is being scraped <laughs> very deeply to try and figure out ways that we can communicate our diversity without doing damage. Totally. I definitely think that there's a lot of space for that. And I think that, you know, as much as like you start messing with like things that are viewed as kind of like fact and, and science, like mm -hmm. I understand why sometimes, you know, that's a huge controversy or something that people don't want to see happen. But I think that when you kind of look at the way that our society functions, like we're just constantly changing and evolving and growing. So I think that this is just like another example of ways that like we didn't know the earth was round until we knew it was round you know yeah. so I think that there's definitely room for scraping and changing and <laughs> <laughs> reinvestigating and kind of changing the way that we view those things because there's just a lot of people who live their life uncomfortable until those changes are made mm -hmm. so I think it's definitely worth the growing pains of it oh true I and I have to realize that whatever system we come up with is going to be changed again and again. It, the, the objective is not to come up with the end-all be-all of language around sexuality because it's just going to keep going totally. and going and going. Are you satisfied with the identity of queer or pansexual you said you'll sometimes use to describe yourself? Or is there another term that you've come up with that you've coined for yourself? There isn't another term that I've come up with, though I do kind of like feel a longing for one. I think that queer is the closest that I've ever come, and I only started using that within the last like year or so. Mm -hmm. I never liked the word pansexual, but that's mostly just like it doesn't sound like good to, <laughs> in my mouth or my ears to hear or say. It's just not, I've n I like love, you know, the fact that it exists, but mm -hmm. like as a word mm -hmm. was never my favorite. The same with like, all through high school and stuff, I identified as bisexual because mm -hmm. I was like, okay, well, I like both. This mm -hmm. is great. Um, and then I learned what pansexuality was, and I was like, oh, that's probably more me because, mm -hmm. you know, I don't care about – it doesn't have to be man or woman. It could be any other variety. I love it. And so the labels – are totally cool with me. It's just like the words themselves. I think if if that super cool new word that fits my sexuality <laughs> comes into existence by some awesome person I follow on Twitter, I'm super down. Um, but right now, I'm super. I'm I'm happy with queer. I think it fits me pretty well, especially because. I don't know, it's kind of more overarching. Like when I think about like myself as someone who identifies as queer, I just think about every person who has some kind of experience with their sexuality that is not, I don't know, the just like norm. Mm -hmm. I think that it, it's it's so much bigger than just like you can or cannot fit into one of these labels. I think that I struggled a lot when I was younger with feeling like I didn't, I wasn't gay enough or I wasn't mm -hmm. like bisexual erasure is so real and things like that. I just felt like depending on the groups I was in, I just wasn't whatever I needed to be enough. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I like queer because I don't have to explain how much of anything I am. I'm just, that's what I am. And it could be just about anything. And that's exciting to me. It is yeah. super exciting. It also brings up how language is fluid because queer was very offensive. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a, a term that was used to cause pain and harm. And now you have a whole generation reclaiming that word. And then like you, you love it. It totally. feels good. It feels good in your mouth to say and identify as. So Oh, I have hope. I yeah. hope that we'll find a language that's appeasing to everyone. Uh, what do you think about numbers? I think it's rad. For sexual orientation? Yeah. I mean, I feel like it, because I've always, like, really loved the idea of, like, 
it being on kind of like this spectrum. Mm -hmm. So I feel like numbers are kind of like one of the closest ways that we can talk about that spectrum in a way that kind of our brains can like actually wrap our head around it better. Yeah. Because you can't just be like, oh, I'm somewhere on the spectrum. Let me point at this like line and be like, I think I'm kind of around here. Like you're not carrying around that line to point out when you're talking to people. Mm -hmm. So a number system is kind of like the way to be able to talk about that spectrum in a way that makes more sense than you know, some of the words that have connotations attached to them. I think that that's an incredibly insightful way to look at it. (laughs) Would you, do you identify as one of Kinsey's numbers? I was thinking about that. And I feel like at any given point in my life, I've been a different number. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So yes, but also kind of like definitively, probably not. I think, Mm -hmm. you know, it kind of depends on where I've been or what my mindset has been or who I'm dating, things like that. But it's definitely a good start for a lot of people. You know, if you're you're just talking about it, like, obviously your sexuality is, like, nuanced and there's so many different – everybody has their own experience, so there's layers of complexity to it. But, you know, if I were talking to somebody who's like, hey, there's this cool scale, what number are you? Like, I could probably pick a number, probably, like, five or six. <laughs> okay. And so yeah. – but, like, obviously with that, there's like, oh, but in my past this or, you know – I don't know what my future looks like or anything like that. Obviously, those numbers are subject to change, but there's definitely, I think it's a good space for people who are trying to figure it out or fit in to one of those. Yes, agreed. I think that the problem with it now is that it is, it's linear, right? Mm -hmm. So even though it's a spectrum and we're going from zero to six with zero being exclusively heterosexual and six being exclusively homosexual, it's again relying on these concepts of sex assigned at birth or gender, Mm -hmm. and it's not making room for the fact that those are already polarized, that that's a binary Mm -hmm. within a spectrum. And so I am imagining not just a plane where it goes out from there, but it's more to me like space. Mm -hmm. And you are this star or this planet or this comet, et cetera, in a three-dimensional area. Totally. That's, I like that visual so much better. Ah, thank you. (laughs) Yeah. Now we just have to figure out how to categorize those those very unique (laughs) billions of options, possibilities. Have you ever done Klein's grid? Have you ever done Klein's grid? Okay. Are you willing to do it right now? Totally. Okay. So I'm going to pull it up here. It's Something that you can just get for free online. The dream. Right? And it's a form of understanding sexual orientation that still relies on the binary, but it's a little bit more broad because it's looking at your romantic orientation and your political orientation and your social orientation. But goodness gracious, I wish even if we could just start the conversation about how to come up with a way to have these conversations a better way of measuring or illustrating sexual orientation, that would be great. Yeah, I agree. But I think that, I, I don't know, I have a lot of hope for the future and that kind of thing being created and available and started those conversations being started. I think that, you know, with each generation, they just get like more ready to be open to new things. And Go ideas. generation, <laughs> go do it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> If we come up with one by the end of the show, that's great, too. We can call it the Lindsay Ash scale. (laughs) Okay. Uh, So here we have this quiz. I just searched for Klein's grid, and then this is sid.south southampton.gov.uk and this says please note your result will not be stored although you may wish to copy the result into a blog or onto your website now we have three categories we've got your past your present and your ideal so first your sexual self have you experienced sexual attraction in the past to other sex only other sex mostly other sex somewhat more both sexes same sex somewhat more same sex mostly same sex only um i would say in the past same sex mostly see already i'm frustrated with this because when i think about you and your relationship with somebody who's non-binary i'm just pissed for you yeah i mean i was thinking about like her listening i mean but i yeah 
but that's the nature of like the things like this you know there isn't somebody needs to make one that's updated basically <laughs> okay i'm gonna ju- i'm not we're not gonna do this whole thing right now because <laughs> i'm pissed but i'm gonna ask you three more questions just so that i can get more angry and <laughs> and then we're gonna let's just try and solve the problem okay so now we have i'm just gonna skip ahead aspects of sexual orientation so your emotional preference same options referring to let's do the present um other sex only other sex mostly other sex somewhat more both sexes same sex somewhat more same sex mostly or same sex only same sex only same sex only for emotional preference presently yes interesting yeah I love all all of the sexes. I, <laughs> Support me emotionally, everyone, please. It's funny because, it, like, in the past, if, you know, if I had been asked that question, like, two years ago, mm-hmm. my answer would have been so different. You know, I was dating a man. I had a lot more, like, men in my life who were kind and, and gentle to me. And mm-hmm. now I just, like, I have friends who are guys for sure. And, like, emotionally, they're super great. But, like, I just, I find myself now, like, not wanting to be, like, emotionally vulnerable in that way. And especially, like, romantically not interested at all. So I think it's just, like, I've just grown to be in a different phase in my life right now. But, yeah. yeah and if you had asked past me, it would have been, like, probably the same amount both maybe. So I don't know. Yeah, preferences, yeah. right? Or orientation. Just It's not even a conscious choice for it. A lot of people, it's way it's the way that their kind of internal compass points them. Okay, let's see. How about sexual identification in the future? See, this is another reason that it's going to make you so mad <laughs> and make me so mad. These are your options. Heterosexual only, heterosexual mostly, heterosexual somewhat more, hetero gay hyphen lesbian equally, gay lesbian somewhat more, gay lesbian mostly, gay lesbian only. <laughs> That does make me mad because, like, I've never in my life identified as a lesbian. I, like, actively do not feel like I belong to the lesbian community. But. Well, (laughs) Klein and your grid that was supposed to be this regressive alternative to Kinsey. (laughs) Sometimes I do, like, I will be like, oh, I'm super gay. So maybe I can just say, I'll just say gay. (laughs) Even though that's not, it's not intended for me. Well, and if we're talking about your future, it sounds like we want to be even more accurate Mm -hmm. than, you know, the scale that was created. Yeah, it needs to be updated. Okay, so already I have some (laughs) ideas about how to update it. Okay. I think we have to sort through the difference between sex and gender. And if we want to keep either of them. Mm Mm-hmm then we need to be saying things like all, let's say we go with gender, all genders rather than both or neither or either. And that's such a, it seems like such a small word change, but it's so huge. It's so huge. It's so huge. Like when I see things like all or like any, things Mm -hmm. like that, I'm like, yay, this is great because now my partner doesn't have to feel excluded or singled out or anything. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Like Mm -hmm. all. Yeah. Totally. Okay. So we've got that. And then what do you think about the three different time periods for understanding somebody's orientation, looking at their past behaviors, fantasies, social structure, political, emotional, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Um, versus what's going on with them maybe within these last 12 months and then what they hope for in the future. I think that there's a space for it. I don't necessarily think, like, if I'm thinking about myself, I don't think that it necessarily, like, for example, with the future stuff, Mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't know. I I see that it could change, but I don't have, like, a plan. Like, where I'm at right now feels pretty good. Mm -hmm. So it feels kind of like maybe there's space for other things instead of the future, like, or even just, like, a change of, like, maybe going from ideal to, like, kind of more in the direction of ways that you'd like to grow in being comfortable with that space. I don't know. I've never really had an ideal about my sexuality. Mm-hmm. Like, aside from, like, a little bit when I was, like, dating men where I was like, this feels maybe not right. Maybe in yeah. the future I could be somewhere else. So maybe I guess it depends on the timeline you're at. You know, I feel like pretty confident in where I'm at right now. So maybe the future, that's why it doesn't feel as specific to me. Mm-hmm. But 
you know, past me probably would have felt that it was pretty relevant. So <laughs> I guess I uh, kind of backtracked a little bit. Well, but. maybe it has to do with how happy you are in your present. Because I'm thinking about people in similar situations to your past mm-hmm. where their behaviors are very uh, heterosexual, both past and present. But their goal, their ideal design for their lives is that they reach a point where they feel comfortable being queer or lesbian or gay or bisexual or whatever that is where they totally. get to have the lifestyle that they want. So Yeah, that's a good point. I think that if I had taken that kind of like test a few years ago, I think I would have been so excited that someone cared about like my goals for the future being different than my present because like that was something that I dealt with a lot in talking to like my friends who were like super, super like into like like either my gay friends or like le- my lesbian friends who are like, I'm so here for this community and it's great. And I was like, well, I don't really, <laughs> like I'm not really seen like I fit in. And none of them really like, my future plans weren't included. Mm-hmm. So I feel like if I had taken a test that have been like, well, in the future, like who would you like to be <laughs> dating basically? I would have been like, finally, someone cares. <laughs> so I think that that's like a really valid point of everybody's kind of on their own journey and depending on where you are in your present does drastically affect how you view that future. So okay, there's definitely space for it now that I think All about right, it. All right, let's keep time frames. What do you think about the idea of questioning? So I'm imagining individuals who might be in a certain place in terms of their behaviors or their fantasies, but they might not feel as committed to that orientation as others. And I think it would be cool to kind of factor in the saturation level of your fill in the blank. Totally. Like almost, yeah, how would you kind of like word that though without getting it wrong? (laughs) <laughs> I can't word anything without getting it wrong, Ash. Like, kind of. uh, let's see. What I'm imagining in my head is something that's very three-dimensional. And so there is this – it's like a piston almost for homosexuality. And you push it down for how maybe confident you are in your attraction there or how connected you feel to that. Mm. And then this – the space between where it started and what you push down to is your level of questioning. Oh, interesting. That's kind of cool. Because I feel like the things that like in those tests bother me the most is like that I always kind of some like fit in the in-betweens of like somewhat and a lot or like, yeah, you know, like all the way this or moderately this. I'm like, I'm kind of like moderately all the way, you know, like (laughs) I'm somewhere in between. So I feel like in that kind of scale, like you're able to just be like, oh, this feels about right. Like I'm going to press down this much and this feels about me as opposed to like, "Mm, I guess I'll pick one of these things that doesn't still totally feel like me because there's only four check boxes that I can pick from, you know. Well, and that might be the bigger problem with even trying to come up with a grid or a scale is that we're trying to take an infinite amount of variables and put them into some sort of categorization symbol. Sim- categorization? Is that a word? <laughs> it sounds like I think your point system? is getting across. And <laughs> there that's we the go. Important part. I'm the, uh, we need, what is his name? Alan, he's the one who invented the modern day computer. Alan Turing. Um, he was ah, such a cool guy and such a great story, and I don't know if I can articulate like articulate it clearly, but basically, Alan Turing was someone who identified as a man and was attracted to men, married a woman, invented the computer, which I believe ended World War II, and couldn't have any of that information shared with the public because, one, a ton of it was secret and the rest of it was illegal. And so he ended up dying um, without anyone knowing that he was this amazing war hero or being able to express his sexual orientation without shame. So, Alan Turing, we need you to come back from the dead (laughs) And come up with a computer that can take all these variables, the endless variables, right? Like how he solved the the World War II problem with the Germans and, you know, give us a system. Or not. That's the other thing. (laughs) Or not. Like maybe we don't even need to categorize anybody, but it just seems like such a human urge to do. Yeah. 
the visual that keeps coming into my head is like, you know, when you have the like in Photoshop or whatever, the color wheel that's just like every color that you can fit in this circle. Mm-hmm. I feel like it just that that's how many options there needs to be. If you can move your mouse like just a hair over and it's a different color, but it still looks similar to the color you were on before, like that's how many variables are in sexuality. Like there's just like there's so much. Like obviously like that's why there's these handful of terms. Because, like, obviously we're not going to have a term for every color of the rainbow in that level of detail. Like, obviously we have, you know, red through purple. But I feel like what it feels like to me is, like, we've got this, like, solid rainbow, right? That's, Mm -hmm. like, red, orange, green, all those colors. Mm -hmm. But we need, like, the color wheel. We do. Well, and I don't even think it – I think that a circle isn't even enough. It needs to be a sphere. Totally. And it needs to be, like – Iron Man style where you can have it up in the space in front of you, not on a a laptop, and then you can expand it and it can get bigger and fill in with more saturation and hues and all of that. And then, you know, there are going to be people who are like, boop, and they point out beyond the sphere. Totally. I'm I'm not participating here either. (laughs) Well, and that's good. Like, create your own little spheres. That's great. I think that needs to be, like, your next T-shirt design. It's just this big, colorful sphere on a T-shirt. It has this little tiny dot. Me. You or, are here. Or what I wanted to do, so in the, the episode that is about sex scales, which we listened to at the beginning, I wanted to make T-shirts that had the Kinsey scale on it where people could just then draw oh, cool. their part of the graph. But yeah, that would be even cooler and much more accurate to sexuality now where it is a colorful sphere and then people can take a fabric marker or a Sharpie and go, boop, totally. that's where I am. That would be so wonderful and interactive. Wouldn't it? <laughs> but it it still doesn't put a word to it as yeah. the problem. It, it gives it space, but not a word. Exactly. So here's another thing I'm thinking about. We've done questioning. We've done gender, sex assigned at birth, et cetera. What if we had it be a code? So, for example, the first category is, do you have a penis, a vulva, or some sort of intersex genital configuration? So you would put P, V, or I. And then the next categorization would be your hormones. What is the strongest hormone coming into your system? Is it testosterone, estrogen, androgen, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure somebody is going to tell me that my science on this is off. <laughs> they're coming for you. Then there could be something like your internal anatomy. Do you have testes, ovaries, something else? You could look at your gametes. Do you produce sperm, eggs, something else, none, all, et cetera. And you could just go category by category to understand your sex assigned at birth and then who you are attracted to based on those variables so kind of like the myers-briggs of sexual sexuality actually that sounds rad because like that's like you basically there's you just created the ability for all those variables to be accounted for you would just have to come up with all of them first like to make sure that it was inclusive but yeah well that and as i'm talking about it i'm realizing where it breaks down so one part is that i don't think attraction is necessarily based on what gametes the person produces, but we don't know because attraction is beyond our understanding right now because we cannot measure it. And then the other breakdown is that when I talk about heterosexuality and homosexuality, et cetera, I get really annoyed that the definition is usually that you are attracted to the same sex or another sex or something, something, right? It's it marks who you are attracted to, which is not true because if I identify as heterosexual, that implies that I am attracted to people who identify as men. Mm-hmm. And that – no, 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 no. No, I am not <laughs> attracted to people who identify as men. I'm just not attracted to people who identify as not men Interesting. generally. Interesting. So I think that when we talk about sexual orientation, it should be more about – what we're not attracted to rather than what we are. Hmm. (laughs) We're really having very deep conversations here. Yeah, really. I don't think we're going to come to any answers today. This is going to be like the rest of my week, just like, oh, Lindsay, what have you done? (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> but I, I mean, I think that's good. I think that's where change happens anyway, mm -hmm. is like you don't have to come up with new answers until you start asking questions that we don't have them for. It would be better to have scales based on what we're not attracted to. Like, we don't know yet. Let's test it out, I guess. Like, So you think that we should create the scale and then test it? I feel like the research has to be done first because I feel on like... On attraction. Yeah, well, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm more of like a like a guess and check kind of person. <laughs> like, let's just go for it and then people can tell us we're wrong and then we know what things we have to change and then we'll go for that and then people will tell us where we're wrong and we're like okay you're totally right I see where you're going let's try something new like that's just... <laughs> so liberating <laughs> <laughs> because like I feel like one of the biggest things with with sexuality and gender and just everything that comes along with it is like the biggest thing holding progress back is like the human need to not be wrong Mm -hmm. Like, and so as soon as people are like, please just like, tell me where I'm wrong and I'll grow, then the floodgates are open. Like, if you want to try something, and then you're open to being kind of like told where, hey, maybe that's not as inclusive as maybe you thought, or hey, I think that this way of doing it would be better, or, you know, you're open to those constructive changes, and you don't get like hurt by it, then everybody's happier, you know, so if you if you just go for it and then you're open to being told you're wrong, then you just go for it again with those changes. Mm -hmm. So just start. And then all of the smart people around the world will <laughs> tell you what needs to change. And then you're like, okay, great. Let's start again. <laughs> all right. So first draft <laughs> exactly. is going to come out this week because <laughs> neither of us can get any work done because we're so obsessed with our new exciting <laughs> prospect. Uh, and then you can all correct us, and we'll do a second draft. <laughs> That's great. All right. Next idea. What do you think about simplifying it to say we have two orientations? One is homosexual. One is, well, let's, let's go three because nothing is binary. <laughs> homosexual, heterosexual, and pan or bi or however we want to say that. And changing the meaning. So or I guess getting back to the actual meaning, homosexual would be that you are attracted to people like you. So for me, that would be small-bodied women that are educated and a little wild who live in the Montana area <laughs> and value the environment. And so if I am attracted to people like that, then I would identify as homosexual. Whereas if I was attracted to somebody with different religious beliefs, political beliefs, different cultural background, upbringing, etc., then I would identify as heterosexual. And if I didn't have a preference either way, if I, if I am just potentially attracted to all of the people, then I would be pansexual or bisexual. I don't know, like both of the, the heterosexual and homosexual, like in that example, they're so, I don't know, like specific that I feel like most people would feel not really drawn to that. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> like I like, for example, like I'm attracted to people who have a lot in common with me, but a lot not in common with me. And so I feel like, like if, if those were the options presented to me, I think I'd be like, hmm, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Could be any on a given day. <laughs> well, I'm thinking about a friend of mine who's actually been on the Sexplanations YouTube channel and says that they are attracted to, I think, masculine women or f and feminine men or vice versa, mm -hmm. where they are almost attracted to people who are like them. Whereas I feel like, I, you know, I am a tiny person. My partner is 240 pounds, very masculine, uh, doesn't have a high school diploma, very, we're very different. Mm -hmm. And so in that way, I would classify myself as a heterosexual. I feel like, I mean, my partner's a little taller than me and she's skinnier than me, but like we're kind of similar in a lot of ways. Like, so are you talking like physically? In any way. I mean, of course we're all different. Yeah. So maybe that's the bigger problem is that in that case, we're all going to be heterosexual because 
everyone is different. Yeah, I feel like in if your end goal was to simplify things, I feel like <laughs> you would just have to blow it up first. Like you would have to get so detailed and like account for so many variables that like as humans we're just like this is overwhelming. How about we simplify it? Like I feel like we'd have to get to the extreme first before we could like go back to simplification because I feel like so much of understanding sexual orientation has been simplified in the past Mm -hmm. that we're just kind of opening Pandora's box on making it complex. We're like, oh, let's mix up what gender means. Let's mix up, like, everybody's understanding of actual, you know, like, sexuality and things like that. So I feel like it needs to go a little bit further with that kind of craziness before Mm -hmm. people are like, let's bring it back to three, (laughs) you know? (laughs) But... I mean, I don't I don't know where all of it's going, so who knows. What are your thoughts on zero? Bringing it back to zero of just saying there's so many possibilities that you cannot put more than one person in the same box and therefore zero boxes. I feel like there's a very large part of me that ad- adores it. I'm like, "Yes, I'm so here for zero." Like Let's just, like, zero it out. It doesn't matter. (laughs) But then I think about all of the people or even, like, myself who are kind of still figuring it out who kind of need that community. Mm. Like, as much as I want it to be irrelevant, like, what my sexuality is, there's power in a community that, that shares that experience with you. Even if their experience is still so different from yours, you feel safer. You feel welcome. You feel at home in a community that shares that experience so almost like as much as i would love you know everybody to be in their own experience and be like zero is the way to go like then you kind of have to wonder well what's happening to those communities that make this safe for people who are figuring it out still you know ash you are rocking this conversation (laughs) (laughs) thanks (laughs) it's awesome because i feel like what i'm doing is verbally processing all of the confusion around sexual orientation in my mind, and that includes gender and identity and expression and performance, et cetera. And you're just getting to be this intelligent, experienced person who <laughs> helps me shuffle through those things and organize them. <laughs> it's been a lot of figuring it out as I go. So I, I've, been, I've been in the spot where I'm like, I don't understand any of it. This feels like a lot of work for me. And, you know, at any given point, for example, my partner's like, I think that maybe you could grow a little bit more in that area. (laughs) And here's some helpful tools in which I can give you. So I'm I'm definitely also still a work in progress. That's a really thoughtful way of putting it. Okay. So before we, we wrap up. I want to do kegels, group kegels. Okay. Feel your kegels if you're able. Main squeeze. You look at you're getting all comfortable on the couch. <laughs> That's wonderful. And I'm thinking that the way we could do this is just go freestyle association, word association. So I'll say a word related to sexual orientation. We'll clench. Then you say a word related to sexual orientation, and we'll re- relax our pubococcygeus muscles and back and forth. Oh, my gosh. That's a lot of, like, thinking and, like— It's so hard. Okay. It really is so hard. <laughs> I'm going to run out of words. I can feel it already, but let's go. No way! <laughs> well, okay, so an alternative is that if you cannot do kegels and word association at the same time, listen to the word association that Ash and I do— and then make up for it by doing kegels later. Okay. Okay. Let's give it a try. Queer. Straight. Breeder. <laughs> um, <laughs> I knew this was going to happen already. I'm like, I can't think of a single word that has to do with sexuality at all. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm thinking about what my body's doing. I'm thinking about... Just all of the terms that I've learned since I was 13 years old. (laughs) And then you say breeders. (laughs) Um, I don't don't have a word. I mean, for the people who are actually doing the kegels, they're still clenching. Oh, my God. I know I am, too. (laughs) We're in this together. I'm stressed out about it, kind of. Um, I'm just going to say lesbian. Homosexual. Okay. Um... Non-binary. Gender fluid. Um, trans. Uh, 
Pansexual. Bisexual. Gender queer. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Let's wrap it up there. <laughs> there are hundreds of them. Hundreds of words. There's yes. so many. And uh, hopefully we will come up with more or we'll figure out a really good system to do this. I'm going to work on it. This awesome. is the goal. And it's going to come with the t-shirt. I'm so excited. Right? And um, we'll go from there. Okay. Any homework assignment that you want to give the audience? I think that one of the coolest things that I ever did for myself was like put aside all of the areas that I thought I needed to fit or thought, you know, like kind of separated myself from all the words that I thought belonged to sexuality and just like thought about like, who I'm excited to be and like who I'm excited to be interested in and then just like sit in that for a minute just be like aside from all of these terms that we just threw out and all of these like ways in which I'm associating guilt or confusion or angst or anything just kind of like put those aside for a minute and just sit there and figure out like what is kind of thing drawing you and just let that be for a minute because I feel like that's really freeing to just be like, I'm not thinking about anything socially that I'm tied to. What do I feel like? I highly recommend. So damn beautiful. <laughs> it's precious. I hope you also write it in your Sexplanations podcast journal so that you can keep track of it, knowing that at this point in time, that is how you feel about who you want to be and who you want to be attracted to. And it can, can change. Yeah. It's beautiful. Well, thank you for being on the show. Thank you for having me. Thank you to Complexly, to Cinema Studios, to Count Boogie, and Cora Amparo. I'm still learning. Mm -hmm.